Hey everyone, welcome again to Bama Bug Fest on the web, a virtual event dedicated to the fascinating world of insects. Uh, Bama Bug Fest on the web is a collaborative event brought to you by UA Museums, the Warner Transportation Museum, the Alabama Museum of Natural History, the Department of Research and Collections at UA, UA's Rogers Library, and the Tuscaloosa Public Library. We're offering nine total days of bug-themed content that started on July 7th and will be ending next Saturday, July 25th. For a full schedule of events, you can check out our website at bamabugfest.org. Today we are talking all about moths and butterflies, and we are about to jump into a program about insect iconography with Dr. Jim Knight, a Curator Emeritus of American Archaeology for the Department of Research and Collections. So hi, Dr. Knight. Hello, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Um, so we talked about, we just got off of the um, and a, a program that was called uh, Butterflies Are Moths, But Moths Aren't Butterflies. And so today is just all about moths and butterflies. And we thought it would be a great way to incorporate some more of a historical element to it, not just the um, biology side of things. And so we thought, you know, that's what we reached out to you and, and are appreciative of you spending some time and, and expertise with us today. So thank you so much for being here. Glad to do it. Um, so, as you're watching, if you have a question for us, feel free to pop it into the comments. Um, we will be monitoring the comments and can put them up live if that's something that you would like to ask questions about as, as we're going through this talk today. Um, but if you don't get a chance to put comments in right now, if you're not able to watch this live right now, um, don't forget that you can also continue to add comments later on and um, we can get them to Dr. Knight to see if he can help us with answering them um, a little bit later on. So. I think we should probably get started on this whole thing. And I, I have to ask you, you know, probably a pretty basic question, but hopefully one that you can help me out with. And that is basically what is iconography? So we're talking about insect, insect iconography. And I think I have a pretty general idea of what iconography is, but I could, I would appreciate the help if you could help me understand that term a little bit better. Sure, sure. So iconography is one of those um, iconology uh, kind of, uh, Orography words that uh, <laughs> study of something, right? And so it's the study right. of uh, images and how to interpret those images. So if, for example, you, you're looking at a painting and uh, the painting has, uh, has some buildings and people in the painting um, and you're trying to interpret what that represents, what are those buildings, who are those people, what are they doing, then you're doing iconography. That's the interpretation of icons or images. And so what, I'm, what I'll be doing as an iconographer um, is talking about prehistoric iconography where we have lots of images from Moundville and that requires iconographic interpretation, interpretation of what is going on in these, in these images, What's, what are these pictures of. So that's, that's iconography. So is iconography, um, if you were to go into and, and learn about how to do iconography, is that is that an anthropology, something that's an anthropology, or is that something that's in the, like in an art department, or is it an intersection between the two, or somewhere else completely? Uh, iconography is uh, is something that anthropologists do, but they've sort of borrowed it from the art historians. So right now it's it's split at least at least uh, the kind that I do in, in prehistoric iconography. It's split between. Uh, art historians on the one hand and anthropologists on the other, and we sort of share. That's great. I think uh, I think one of the things that not just for this segment, but other segments in Bugfest that we've come across quite a bit is is that intersection of of areas of study. We found that quite often, and I think it's wonderful. We get to you know not everyone. You don't have to just you get to work with lots of different people from across different departments and different uh, fields of study, which is kind of neat. Um, Okay, so we have a, a, a pretty, you know, large and I think important archaeological site in our backyard here in Tuscaloosa um, called Moundville. I mean, there's a, a park there and a museum and interpretive center. And, um, you know, I know if you had a chance to, if, you've, if anyone of the, who have been watching have ever had a chance to go into the museum, I know that you've seen some of these beautiful images that are found um, throughout the museum. So I'm assuming, you know, like that, uh, study of those images would be under the iconography grouping. Is, is What role did iconography play in that culture at Moundville? Well, uh, you know, if you think of iconography as the study of something, that's what we're doing now. So 
if we're talking about the art itself, we're, we're talking more or less about um, the icons themselves, the representations that are there, you know, and um, and we can talk about uh, what, so the iconography of those images is trying to figure out what those artisans so many hundreds of years ago were up to, what were they trying to depict? And so we have some thoughts about that as anthropologists and archeologists. So we can get into that, but I thought we ought to um, do a little bit of context work first and uh, show a slide or so uh, or two of, um, of Moundville and, and and get into it that way. Can we yeah, start that, sounds, that way? Yeah, absolutely. That sounds great. Let me go ahead and get that popped up. Can you see them? Yeah, so. Is that the yeah, one so, right there? Yeah, sure. Let's, let's start right there. So um, Moundville is uh, the capital town of uh, a large society that existed on the Black Warrior uh, River Valley in West Central Alabama. And it existed uh, between about, and uh, these are these are about uh, approximate dates, 1150 to 1520, as it says right there, AD. And that would be from about 870 to about 500 years ago. And that context, it makes a difference in the kind of, arch uh, kind of iconography it is, because that's so long ago, that's so many centuries ago that uh, we can't simply turn to the Native American iconography of, say, a, modern, a particular modern tribe and say, let's use that as our source. Uh, we'll use the beliefs and the, uh, the mythology and so forth of that particular group to try to inter use that to interpret something that's that old. And it's not nearly that straightforward. Uh, the truth is we don't know wh any particular uh, Native American tribe that is descended from Moundville and probably many, uh, many uh, modern tribes have some roots at Mamble, so it's not a, not a direct relationship at all. So uh, the iconographer's job is to, uh, is to look at the art itself and see what the art itself tells us uh, in the first place about, about what's going on there. So um, Mamble artisans left us a lot to talk about. They left a lot of imagery, um, and some of it's engraved on pottery, and some of it's painted on pottery. Some of it's uh, engraved on uh, on uh, tabular stone objects. There are carved stone uh, pipes, and there are carved stone axe heads, and uh, embossed sheet copper artifacts, and, and um, uh, engraved engraved uh, shell artifacts, and so forth. And and for that matter, there were probably there's probably at Mamble. Uh, uh, an elaborate wood carving tradition, but but since wood doesn't preserve in that environment in the soils, we we don't know uh, much about it at all. So uh, we do, what we do have though are hundreds hundreds of images, and uh, and so the business of iconography is to try to figure out you know what those uh, what those images uh, represent. Mm -hmm. So. Um, um, to, to do that, you, you, you have to uh, realize that this is not commonplace art, most of what we'll be looking mm -hmm. at. It's, it's uh, religious art for the most part, and then and this would, this, we, these would be things that would be handled by religious specialists, uh, a lot of them. And, and uh, so they're not, they're not really everyday kinds of things. Um, and uh, the, other, the other aspect of it, I guess, is, uh, is is to uh, to try to look, try to think about uh, Native American religious beliefs as uh, as a thing, uh, as as a kind of belief system that we ought to we ought to pay attention to when we're looking at these images. Um, go to the next slide, please, and let's let's uh, let's look at that for a second. And this is this is pretty basic, but uh, when we talk about Native American religion, there, a lot of it is based on a sort of unseen world. We have the world that's all around us of things that we see every day. And beyond that world, uh, there's this unseen world, the beyond world, the supernatural world, and that world is inhabited by spirit beings. And the point of a religious specialist, uh, one of the jobs of the religious specialist, what a religious specialist is good at, is uh, sort of penetrating that boundary and going into the unseen world and trying to uh, petition uh, those spirits for the gifts of their power. Um, so uh, 
what are these spirits? These spirits uh, are of all kinds. There are many of them, and uh, Native American uh, tribes uh, have many stories about them. Uh, there, there are different ranks of spirits. There are different uh, genders of spirits. Uh, some of the spirits uh, are very powerful, and some of them are less powerful. Some of them um, are indifferent to human beings. They, they act as though human beings don't exist. And others, uh, others are extremely dangerous. If you contact one of these, they'll, you're, you're, it'll be certain death. And then uh, yet other ones are approachable by, uh, if, you know, if you know the proper ritual, you can approach them and petition them for their power. And to do that, you'd have to um, know uh, the right apparatus. You'd have to have the correct artifacts. You'd have to know the proper prayers and songs and possibly dances or postures and all of the ritual apparatus that would allow you uh, access to, to, that, to that other world. And so just for just as background there, one of the main things to know about uh, most of the art at Moundville is that that's what it's about. Okay, yeah. Moundville okay. art depicts spirit beings, not creatures of this world. So when you see, for example, uh, a, a Moundville artifact that, it, that's, that you think looks like a duck, well, that's not a duck, you know, uh, or, or if you see one that looks like an insect, well, it's uh, an insect-like spirit. It's not, a, it's not one of the insects that we see in the ordinary world around us. It's not right. a, simply a picture of that, right? It, it is almost always uh, something that's there because a religious practitioner was petitioning that particular spirit for its power. Many of them look like um, birds and insects and uh, and so forth and, and reptiles, but they're not. You can't you can't uh, take out your uh, Peterson's guide, as a friend of mine likes to say, and try to look up what these creatures are because they're not in the Peterson guide. Right. Um, you can spend all day trying to figure out what the um, what the butterfly images are really. You know what what species what, they're, what trying they're based to off. Of, right. Yeah. But, but you know they and they are based off based on the natural world. Uh, because that's what the artisan knows about, right? So, so you'll see parts and in, in parts of images that that are at least vaguely familiar to you. Um, but you'll see a lot of things that are that are simply uh, pretty bizarre and and not familiar at all in the natural mm -hmm. world. And that's that's the that's the way to kind of explain all of that. So it's so it's with that that uh, that I can show you some uh, pictures of uh, what apparently are insects. <laughs> that's uh, great. I think. It's important distinction, I think, to realize. I guess it's not something that I even really think of all the time when I go into the museum and see all of the, you know, depictions that they are of spirit realm and not necessarily physical realm things. And so it's it's nice to keep that in mind. It's it's very good to keep in mind. So um, <laughs> kind of kind of hold your hold your thoughts on what particular species of beetle you think you may be looking at when you. And by the way. I, Insect icon, insect representations at Mountville are very rare, and so I've only got three yeah. to show you. Okay. And, uh, I mean, there are a few more, but uh, but these are the presentable ones, and, and one of them is not all that presentable. So, <laughs> okay. So why don't we just start by? Sh I'm going to show you three objects. Okay. Okay. And we'll just we'll just talk about each one in turn, and then we'll go back to them and, and give you better. Uh, I'll give you better illustrations of what they're showing because the real objects don't necessarily show up very well. So okay. Up next. What do we have next? First, okay. Here's a pot. This is a Mountain water bottle, and there you see a very a formal black and white picture taken of it back in uh, 1979. Mm. Uh, that's its catalog number. NG means it's found near, uh, in just north of Mount G, and that's oh, okay. uh, when you're when you're going to Mount and just just uh, just cross the railroad tracks coming into the park. The biggest mountain you're looking at in front of you is Mount G. So this is oh, okay. found just north of that. Uh, and um, it's uh, the top of it is discolored and uh, and a little bit um, hard. To, well, the whole thing is hard to see because the engraving is so fine. It's on mm -hmm. blackware, and engraved lines on blackware are very fine lines and very hard to see. But um, this vessel is one of the very few at Mountville that people have said over the years depicts what looks like an insect. And I'll mm -hmm. show you a picture of that later. And um, so I, I, you can just sort of barely, barely see what I'm talking about engraved on there, and we'll talk. We'll we'll see a picture of it later and talk about it in some more detail. But let's let's go to the next one. This one's more famous, and the uh, this one uh, is 
called the Willoughby disc. And uh, the original is in the, uh, in the Harvard Peabody Museum. Actually, the Malvo Museum had the original of this for, uh, for, the, for many months, but recently the Harvard wanted it back, and so uh, they had to send it back. It's a disc, and it's made of, um, it's made of shale and it's locally made. We have, to, we have to say that when we talk about Mounville artifacts because many of them are not locally made. They're imported from somewhere else, but this one's local. And uh, it's done in the local style and we see various elements of, of, of Mounville art that are found in other art, art, other artifacts at Mounville. There's a row of, uh, well, there's two skulls mounted on what looks like uh, a sort of uh, twisted rope or something uh, occupying the middle. And then there's two hands off to the side yeah, and uh, with that, uh, what's been called the hand and eye design, but that's wrong. Uh, and then we probably don't have time to talk about all that, but <laughs> oh, that is the what we call the bilobed arrow uh, emblem there. It's, a, it's an arrow basically, but it has two lobes off to the side. And uh, the thing on the left is what we'll mainly be talking about, whatever that is, that pineapple <laughs> on top of a, on top of a, whatever it is, you know. Right, right. Um, so the thing is made of shale, and the whole the surface is very um, is very spalled off, and so you see bits and pieces that are missing from the design. And one thing I want to want to point out right now, uh, before we get any further, is the the circle and dot emblem on the on the left hand side, the large one there. Um, that's all spalled off around that. Now below below where your cursor is, there not that one, but the the one on the the far left. Oh. Uh, in my screen anyway. I can't point. Sorry. No, no. The, okay. <laughs> the other other side of the tab, other side of the ballot there. That, here? Below there. Just below there. That one. There. Bingo. Sorry. <laughs> all around all around that, if you if you have the real thing and you look at it with a 10 power loop like I have done, uh, it's all spalled off. And so we're missing part of the design right there. And that's important uh, because we'll okay. try to complete that part of the design here in a minute. But this is the Willoughby disc. It's uh, one of one of very one of uh, a few fancy objects like this that are decorated like this. But pallets are more common. There are about fifty pallets like this that are circular that have notches around them. And what they're used for is that on the back side of this thing, which is actually the top side, uh, things were mixed. Medicines were mixed. Uh, paints were mixed. Uh, various kinds of um, uh, magical substances and important ritual substances were mixed on the back of this thing, almost like a portable altar. And these things we know were kept in um, in bundles, and we know that because we can see the actual sort of impression or, or faint uh, faint impression of the bundles on many of them uh, huh. at both Mountville and some other sites. And so these things we think were kept in sacred bundles and were used by priests. And again, these priests are uh, spiritual pra uh, practitioners who know how to contact this unseen world, and uh, and this is whatever it means. That's what this is all about: contacting that unseen world. So this is this okay. is well, this is a, a fairly famous artifact. So uh, the interpretation of this comes in a little while. So next, okay. Now this is a a bottle, uh, another Mountville bottle. This one is red painted, and it has a white painted design on top of the red, and uh, it has. Um, some of the same elements uh, that were on that uh, Willoughby disc on it, mm -hmm. and um, and this is much more simplified. But we we can we're going to make a connection here between this bottle and, and the Willoughby disc here, just in a minute. So those are the three artifacts that I have for you to talk about. And so let's go back and talk about them in a little bit more detail. And so we can go to the next slide, and we'll give you some uh, Oops, illustration. Sorry. Yeah, there. Okay. okay. There's that first bottle again, and there's a, a line drawing of the designs uh, that are on it. And uh, oh, wow. there are two. And uh, w one occupies one whole side, and the other is on the other side. So there, there's mm, one, sort okay. of one side, one on each side. As you can see, they're they're kind of alike, um, except. They're kind of different too. There's there are differences in them. Uh, we think they're made by the same artist, um, uh, engraved by the same artist. So, so the question here is, what are we looking at? Right. Well, yeah. I have to go back and say, you know, whatever you whatever you see here, it's probably a spirit being, not a real not a real insect. But but people have said for a long time that this these look like insects. So 
what do you think? What, what, what do you think those are? If, if those were based on insects from the natural world. Um, and as soon as you I mean, make, as soon as you choose, by the way, you, 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 you run up against uh, issues of things that don't match, but, but, you know. <laughs> right. But, I mean, go ahead. I can't help but think that they look a little bit like butterflies or moths. Okay. Um, uh, that's, that's valid. Other people have said, you know, they look like, uh, they look more like beetles because of the fat body. And in uh, fact, you know, yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, and the one on the right anyway, uh, because you know, yeah, has, the double wing has that the, the sort of double wing. You know how a, you know how a beetle will, will will sort of it has a hard case shell and it opens that up and the wings are under it and come out. Yeah. Um, so some other people have said beetle, but frankly, as an iconographer, I don't know what that is. I just have no <laughs> idea. But uh, but there it is. It's pretty unique at Marvel. I don't know of any other uh, pottery vessel at Marvel among many dozens that are engraved in this style that have this. So whatever it is, it's important enough to have a ritual meaning. And if it's not insects, I don't know what it is. You know, it's it does, based on insects. It definitely does look insect, like insect in origin. You know, it definitely looks like it's based off of an insect of some yeah, sort. Yeah, yeah. Either those things that are, that it looks like it has a head and it looks like maybe those are antenna that are coming up from it. Right, right. As opposed to what else could that be? Horns, maybe, but I think more maybe, antenna, yeah. uh, antenna would be would be viable. Yeah. So that is some uh, ancient artist's interpretation of a spirit being, wow. insect based. We think. So. It's beautiful. Yeah, and so maybe some maybe some of the viewers out there will will have some better ideas about what what we're looking at. Yeah. But we can go on. Let's move on to the next one, which will be the Willoughby disc again, because that's that's more complicated. This is the line drawing of that that uh, palette that I showed you earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so again, the the elements there are the central sort of bundle of rope like thing that that uh, goes from top to bottom. There are two skulls on it, and uh, the hand and eye designs are they're double. And by the way, if you've seen an interpretation of the hand and eye that says that it is a constellation in the sky, this is this is a, throws a little bit of a monkey wrench into that because there are two side by side. It looks like they're both hands are represented, and then uh, below that and overlapping in the fingers just a little bit is that bilobed arrow, and then there's that element off to the left that we're going to be talking about. Scholars uh, kind of left that alone, you know, held that. 10 feet away for years and years and years and just sort of refused to interpret that. It, mm -hmm. uh, to one, one, uh, one analyst thought it looked just like sort of skillful doodling, but, but it's not doodling. Mm -hmm. it's, it has a religious purpose like everything else on the palette. And we, we have to assume that it, it was of equal importance at least to what, el what else was there. Mm -hmm. um, other people have said it looked like a bit of fabric or you know, just uh, an, an odd assemblage of characteristics. Some people said the bottom part of it that's spiked there and curls, that might be a, a conch shell symbol. And mm -hmm. the, people were just sort of uh, specialists. We're, we're, we're not sure at all what that was. And so um, I, uh, a friend of mine, um, Judith Frank, who, uh, formerly worked for the Dixon Mound Museum in, in, uh, in, in Illinois. Uh, she and I both came up with the same idea more or less at once. So we, we joined forces and wrote, a, wrote a, an academic article about this thing and tried to figure it out, basically. So we turned it on its side and compared it to some other things. And we, and we came up with a comparison, which is, I think, on the next slide. OK. So there it is on the bottom. And what, I, what I've done in the picture is I've filled in the part with dotted lines that's, that's broken off. That, that jag, I've given it a jagged edge. It didn't necessarily have a jagged edge, but anyway, we think it's closed, okay? okay. So those are, those are two overlapping fan-like devices, okay, at the top. Yeah. And so what, you know, comparing it to the picture above, and that's another archeological object, um, that comes from Northwest Georgia and that's, that's more readily identifiable as an insect-like thing, right? Yeah. With, um, and a long, large proboscis that sticks out from the from the uh, from the top and has a yeah. the head is reduced to a kind of just the eye, 
Right. And, and uh, then we have the segmented body, which ends in a kind of fishtail-like thing. And then the sort of overlapping uh, wings on the back. And we compared that with the image on the Willoughby disc and said, you know, that sure looks like the same thing in two different art styles. And uh, so we went from there. And so that became a moth supernatural or butterfly mm. supernatural. You know, we're not being we're not being very specific about that. But right. if you look back at the uh, if you look down at the Willoughby disc image there, you see what the head is again reduced to uh, you know, reduced to just the eye. Then you have a segmented body ending, mm -hmm. ending in that forked um, tail device. And uh, entomologists say that when you have a forked tail like that, it indicates that the uh, it's a male. I didn't know mm -hmm. that when we started out. But then we have the overlapping uh, wings that are decorated with dots. And at least one of them has, uh, has a sort of jagged edge. Um, now moving, and, and you notice they're overlapped in an interesting way. Uh, yeah. so, that the, so that the back one is actually overlapping in both cases the the front one. Um, mm -hmm. So what what about that that's out in front of the eye? Um, it, on the Willoughby disc, that that fringe like element element that comes not that but the uh, the one that thing um, it corresponds on the on the one from Georgia mm -hmm. with something that looks a whole lot more like antenna coming straight yeah. up out of the eye, that thing. Okay, I can, I can, I can see antenna there. So right. the corresponding thing on the Willoughby disc might be some sort of short stubby antenna-like device. And then on both, we have that, that curly spiked element, which then becomes with the moth interpretation, the proboscis. Right. All right, right, which, it, which has this long curl proboscis now. Yeah. Um, one interesting thing too is that um, the way those wings are depicted says something about butterfly versus moth, right? Because moths mm -hmm. have their wings rest rest at rest in a different position than butterflies do, right? This, right. So this uh, this would suggest butterfly, right? Because it it, it has it, if this is to be meant to be at rest, the wings are upright, and the and the the lowermost wing is actually overlapping the uh, the front wing, which right. is how which is how it looks when you look at a butterfly with its wings at rest, uh, stationary. Um, so anyway, uh, this was back in 1993. We came up with the notion that this was some sort of moth-based or moth or butterfly lepidopteran, I guess, based uh, supernatural. Yeah, and, um, it's rare at novel. It exists on very, very, very few artifacts. Um, and it exists at least partially on, let's see what the next slide is. There, that there's that bottle again. Yeah. And there we have uh, a dotted wing that has, has a sort of serrated edge to it that's similar mm -hmm. to what we saw on, on both of the other artifacts, one from Northwest Georgia and from, uh, from, uh, uh, from Mandel. And, and also that uh, something that resembles that long uh, proboscis. Yeah. And so what we think this bottle is, is doing is showing us apart for the, apart for the whole, a pars pro toto version of this uh, moth supernatural being. Without showing us the whole creature, they're giving us enough, enough indications to figure it out. Right. By giving, it, giving us the proboscis in both, and in, in the wing on both sides. And there are very, very few bottles like this. Uh, and none, none, uh, none. In fact, that have that are done in red paint, red and white paint, like this at Novel oh. that have this that have this image. This is the only one, and it came from uh, Mound C, um, in the uh, wow, uh, and on the north end of the park. So, so those are those are the those are the three things, and uh, go to the next slide, then please. All right. So the next thing, uh, the next instinctual thing you'd want to do is say, well, what kinds of butterflies and moths have rounded, uh, rounded um, emblems or rounded elements on their wings and have that have a sort of serration effect on the outer margin? And yeah. one, one answer is this: this is a common buckeye butterfly. Um, you know, it's the, the it's not it's not perfect the uh, the analogy here, but 
but at least this is one common butterfly that has that. Yeah, and you um, can see the elements though. I mean, I can yeah. see what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah, you see the serrations down in the, especially on the on the lower wings there. At least the yeah the, the, those kinds of things. They're not exactly what the artisan uh, showed us, but but at least that's a possibility. Right. So. So there's one, and we could go. We could go on, you know, going through the butterfly book and, and checking this or that or the other um, species to see if there's a better match. But ultimately, that's pretty hopeless because we go. We always come back to the notion that that we're not going to find it. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not going to find it because it's it's a supernatural being. It's not. It's not of this world. So it's intentionally different, right? Right. So anyway, that's. Let's go to the next slide. So now the question is, um, what role did this butterfly or moth supernatural play in uh, the ancient Mississippian world, you know, seven or 800 years ago? And this is not from Mountville. This is an engraved shell gorget from Northwest Georgia. And it shows a being. And so let's, uh, this is a supernatural being again. You can tell it's not somebody dressed up in a costume because right. just by looking at the feet, right? Because the feet are bird feet. Yeah. And the nose is not a normal human nose. This is a sort of a bird human figure. Mm -hmm. And um, it's in a, in a sort of dancing posture. So we, we, you know, some people say it's dancing. It's, it's at least in the kind of posture that might be dancing because one leg is up to, uh, up to one side and, and the other leg is curled tightly up under it so you can just barely see the uh, other foot tucked under it there. Um, and so uh, this thing is wearing a sort of diaper-like decorated um, uh, loin device. It has a sash with a knot uh, with uh, parts of the sash hanging down behind uh, one side. Uh, it's wearing a uh, a beaded necklace and it has uh, it has a conch shell inverted conch shell uh, at the center of that necklace is the centerpiece mm -hmm. a three-part headdress uh, and we could talk about that if we wanted to uh, what that is all about it is a winged being it's shown the wing is shown in profile on one side mm -hmm. and uh, but we're interested in here in what it's holding uh, in one hand it's got a, a, a flint uh, sword and we know it's that right sword um, the, yeah, that thing is a flint sword, and we know that's true because there are actually several of these things, and we have the the actual flint swords uh, that uh, we find archaeological that are found archaeologically, and they they match that profile, and so that's what that is. The, this being is holding a flint sword in one hand, and mm -hmm. grasped in the other hand is our is our moth or is our moth butterfly supernatural. Um, it's it's being. Uh, held by the proboscis in the other hand and just sort of hanging down. The body goes behind the, the leg of the of the creature that's holding it. But you see sort oh. of the rest of it there. There you see the forked tail going behind. That's the tail right there. Yeah, that's the tail going behind the leg of the creature that's that's holding it. Yeah. So so most experts that have, most uh, specialists that have looked at this artifact from Northwest Georgia think that it's a posture of hostility or attack. In other words, the moth mm -hmm. creature is being attacked or by uh, somebody brandish, brandishing this, uh, this flint sword. That's one interpretation. And in fact, uh, uh, Professor Kent Riley, who's been on, on the Moundville Mondays uh, broadcast from the museum at least twice recently, that's, that's his interpretation. It's a valid one. Um, and that that's much in line with what a lot of people have said, but I, I want to point out another way of looking at this thing. Mm -hmm. And that is that if we think of this as a, uh, a super powerful supernatural being that's important enough to have to wear on a, on a gorget, and by the way, a gorget is something that, that's drilled for suspension, that you wear it on your chest, and that, that's mm -hmm. what this is. Um, then it, uh, then it's, if, if it's that important, you know, it, it's showing us uh, something about its powers and what are its powers? Well, it has a chert knife on the one, in, on the one side, but maybe the way to look at this is to say it's holding two of its most important powers in its hands. Mm -hmm. One would be the power of warfare, some emblem of warfare, the chert sword, and the other thing would be whatever it is 
this uh, this other supernatural being and it's all of its association so it'd be instead of attacking one with the sword it, it could be seen as whole is dancing in a dancing posture and holding up both of its power objects um, so what in the world then would um, would the power object be that would be uh, that would have as its emblem this moth supernatural um, and our our Native American friends back in the 90s uh, came came to the rescue here and suggested something that's that's interesting and let's go to the next slide that's a sphinx moth uh, otherwise known as mock moth they're nocturnal um, and they go around uh, sticking their extremely long proboscis like this one is doing um, down and that's its feeding tube down into a deep flower uh, and connecting uh, collecting the nectar and it's what it's doing there is it's pollinating the tobacco plant and one of the most ritually important plants to the Native Americans of the Southeast in fact all of North America is tobacco because tobacco is one of the key substances by which religious specialists using the tobacco, uh, smoking the tobacco, use it to communicate with that world, be uh, that beyond world, that unseen world. So here's a, an extremely important ritual plant, and here's its pollinator, uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, this moth with a long proboscis that, that hums around like a hummingbird at night, and it has this, these nocturnal associations, uh, and so there might be a night and day aspect to this, to this yeah. supernatural, but but our Native American friends seized on this uh, immediately. Now it doesn't match the, the you know the the uh, the style of the wings uh, of right. the creature at Mammal, but but we wouldn't expect it to, right? Uh, right. We wouldn't expect everything on there to be just a sort of literal literal sphinx moth on on Mammal artifacts. But I like this. I like the moth creature or butterfly creature as being an emblem of the power of tobacco to reach uh, the, to reach this uh, to for the religious practitioner to use to reach the uh, the other world to communicate with the spirit world beyond using tobacco what better emblem of the of tobacco than to use the animal that pollinates it it's it's hard after all to to uh, to draw tobacco itself right uh, so so I like this. This is a Native American uh, informant telling us that what they think this is, and I think they're. If if that's not it, I like it anyway. I like it's on the, <laughs> it's on the right track. I think. You know, right. To, yeah. To interpreting why that, why we have a moth a creature and what it's what it what role it plays, what it what it's all about there. So we can flip back to the previous slide. If that's right, then what this creature has in its hand is is not. He's not trying to attack the moth. The moth is in a ritually, ritually very important means of communicating with that other world. He's, yeah. just, he's just holding there two emblems of power, one of which is tobacco. And, uh, and the other is, is some sort of uh, emblem probably of warfare and, uh, and, and not, not literal warfare, but uh, mm -hmm. maybe uh, sort of supernatural warfare. And uh, about that, I won't speculate anymore. Uh, but that's right. at least one role that uh, that our moth creature could play uh, our our, uh, our friend uh, professor riley at texas t calls them calls the being mothra after the japanese monster in the godzilla movies but that's of course that's just a joke and right. it's, it's just a you know just a way to talk about it it's a right. little, little nickname uh that he's given it but uh, uh but that's okay we can have nicknames for it um so that's there are really interesting yeah those, yeah those are the uh that that's 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 what we have uh from Moundville for insect iconography it's not a lot to talk about but uh but that's it i think it's it's um i know that it wasn't a lot to talk about but i think it's it seems like um i know i, I kind of like that it took a lot of people to help to sort of put together a possible story of it. It wasn't just iconographers, but it was also people from, you know, the Native American communities sure. and and that uh, like storytelling tradition or, or not even just storytelling tradition, but just their culture in general. Um, it was kind of interesting to, to have that everyone work together to try to figure out what it is. And that the tobacco one, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. It really does, considering if, if tobacco was such an important 
plant, you know, to that spiritual uh, person's in their I like tools. It. I like it. And, and one way to think about that is, is you've got all of this religious imagery. We know that tobacco was important anyway. Uh, uh, pipes are extremely important in many Mississippian cultures, including Mongol, smoking pipes. And so we know they're using pipes to communicate with the other world. Any real religious specialists are doing that. We know we know how important they are ritually. So why wouldn't there be some emblem of tobacco somehow? Mm. Um, just like there should be an emblem, we should expect to find an emblem of the sun and the moon and some other things. Um, we should expect to find an emblem of tobacco. I think this is a pretty good candidate. Now, um, I just want to make sure, because so this imagery that we're talking about is again, if this is a silly question, I'm sorry, but just to make sure it's a separate from like a, a system of writing or, you know, like they're not, it's not just writing day-to-day -day activities. Like you said, this is imagery to depict religious or for religious purposes, right? Yes. That's, uh, pe people ask all the time, is this, is, are images like this at Novel and other uh, sites like this, uh, is that a kind of writing? And the technical answer is no, it's not. Uh, it's not like hieroglyphics. Right. Uh, in, in ancient Egypt, where that actually represents a language, a spoken language, where the elements of the hieroglyphics in that in the Egyptian case represent sounds that come out of your mouth. Um, that's not what this is. Um, and in fact, it's not even picture writing in, in, in the sense that it doesn't convey a narrative all by itself. Right. Um, so it's not it's not it communicates, but not like that. It communicates by being uh, by being an emblem of something. That's okay. So maybe that wasn't such a silly question. I'm glad I asked. No, not that. at all. Not at all. <laughs> um, I think that it seems like a lot of people have really enjoyed and thought it was very interesting. I wanted to say thank you. Um, I'm sure that, you know, we've come across them. I know that I've come across some of this imagery, you know, going through the museum myself, and now I'm going to look at it in a whole new light. So I appreciate that. Um, and um, oh, there was one question I had, though, actually, now that I go back to it, Nick, you said something about um, the items that were found, how some of few of them were made on site, but a lot of them were imported or brought in. Was that do we know much about like how that happened? Is that a like a trade thing or is it just some people came to visit and they were left there? Or do we know anything about those or how that works? Well, uh, one of the biggest jobs for archaeologists is to kind of figure out where things are made. Um, mm. There are, for example, uh, pipes made of limestone that depict panthers that are found. There, several have been found at Mounville, but none of those were made at Mounville because uh, that panther imagery, for one thing, is is a kind of imagery that's native to the lower Mississippi, Val Mississippi River Valley, not mm. Mounville. And the other thing is they're made of a kind of limestone called Glendon limestone that outcrops near Vicksburg, Mississippi. So. You know where oh, okay. those came from. Um, so, so now we have to figure out what 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 place did they have in the Mongol religious system. So, yeah. So we have to we have to when we're looking at something that's found at Mongol, it's not necessarily something that originated at Mongol, and that's a very mm -hmm. important important distinction to make. There are lots of things at Mongol that uh, that got there. Your question about the question about how it got there is a, is an important one. If you go to the Mountville Museum now, the first thing you see when you come in the, the door of the Mountville Museum is a scene of a wedding. Mm -hmm. That wedding depicts the wedding of a local Mountville chief, and the chief's family is shown, to a foreign lady. This lady is arriving from the lower Mississippi Valley, and all of the artifacts that she's bringing, uh, the bride wealth there that's shown all around, that those are not Mountville artifacts. Those are depictions of, those are illustrations of artifacts that come from uh, another style zone, another different, uh, another different area. So, you know, that's marriage would be just one, one good example of how things like that would start out in one part of the uh, United States and end up somewhere entirely uh, different as give, being given as bride wealth gifts for, uh, to seal treaties or uh, as given as a, uh, as gifts in mourning when someone important dies, weddings, yeah. event, events like this, things get given away. Okay, well, that's good. Um, now, have you? Do you? I know that you know you've worked a lot in Moundville in the area. Um, are there? Do you study iconography in any other region of the United States? Are there other insects that 
are insect, well, I should say insect based images that you're aware of that are in from different parts of the country? Well, uh, sure. Um, there are, there's a really interesting one that, uh, that Dr. Riley showed in one of those Mountain Monday broadcasts the other day. It's a, it's an, a painted mural uh, in a kiva, uh, which is a ceremonial room, uh, an underground ceremonial room that's round uh, in the Pueblo area of the southwestern mm -hmm. United States. And, um, and that depicts what for all the world looks like our sort of um, moth supernatural character. It even has the same kind of wings, it has this long curling proboscis coming out for a nose. But that, and that one is uh, anthropomorphic. It's got many human elements that the ones from uh, hmm. Novel in Northwest Georgia don't don't seem to have. But yeah, there's a, uh, but there, and and then uh, and looking around, and the folklorists can can address this a whole lot better than I can. But uh, uh, in the folklore and uh, in mythology and beliefs of uh, various Native American groups all over the uh, all over the present United States. Uh, insects feature in all sorts of roles. That's great. Well, thank you. Um, I think that we've covered quite a bit of, of insect iconography, both at Moundville and around. So I, I just, I think maybe this might be a good place to wrap it up. Do you have any parting thoughts or final, final words that you want to leave everyone with? Stay safe and stay cool. <laughs> yeah, we were, we were just talking about the heat earlier today. It is, it is warm, yes. <laughs> um, so I, get, I would like to thank you all again for joining us for Bama Bug Fest on the web today. Um, make sure to check us out uh, tonight at seven for our daily wrap up. And then again on Tuesday, July 21st for our Pollinators Day. Um, content always appears at 10 to four and uh, at seven and all times are central standard times. If you aren't able to join us in for the live presentations, at the time that they happen, you can always go back and watch them later through archived videos on our social media sites and YouTube channels and with our handy resource guide. Um, make sure to like and subscribe to all of our partner social media pages and channels. And uh, for a full schedule of events, you can find uh, or please visit BamaBugFest.org. It has all of the information that you need um, about the event and what's happening. Um, as always, we want to thank our collaborating partners for making this event happen. And we would like to thank you, Dr. Knight, for joining us today, giving us a little bit of time and your expertise and sharing that with us. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for having me. And um, we are, um, I'm going to link in the comments uh, this great segment that was done um, on our Museums from Your Home series, which was happened from March until May of, of some storytelling from this wonderful storyteller that spoke with people at Moundville. Um, there is a story from what I understand uh, involving a moth, but it's not one that I'm familiar with. Um, and so, and not one that is told in this storytelling segment, but it does tell a great story that does involve um, crawfish, I'm sorry, crayfish. I hear that they're crayfish when you study them, but crawfish when you eat them. So I guess we'll decide which one that is. But um, it, it does depict uh, or does involve uh, crayfish in the story. And we have for our Bama Bug Fest this year, we are talking about all bugs, which are most arthropods. And so I um, wanted to make sure that you guys had access to that. So check out in the comments. I will post that in a second. Um, make sure you get a chance to watch that video because it's got some wonderful, wonderful interviews and stories in there. Um, but for now, I guess I'd just like to say see you all next time on Bama Bug Fest on the web, and we hope that you have a great day. Bye. Thanks. Take care, everybody.